Welcome to Camelback Bible Church. We're so glad you could join us this morning, whether here in person or online. And uh, as we begin, we just have a few announcements. The first is we would love for you to join our family. At Camelback, we are on a mission uh, for the glory of God, and part of that is building a community that has a family-like feeling. The idea that we're adopted as sons and daughters into God's family uh, through Christ. And so with that in mind, we do have a membership class starting up next week. It's going to be over Zoom, so if you have concerns about that, uh, we encourage you to still be able to join us. And that is starting next week, so you can sign up online. Uh, if you receive our emails, you should have a link in that uh, to register, and if not, you can find the registration link on our website, or you can just email me, acaswell at camelbackbible.com, and we'll make sure to get you the information that you need for when it kicks off next week uh, on Sunday the 13th. Second, uh, our women's kickoff event is this Thursday, uh, and it's also online, and that also kicks off their weekly book study on Thursday evenings, and the information has also been sent out in an email. It's available on our website. We encourage you to uh, register for this, uh, this Thursday night, uh, ladies, and, and join us for that, and then also plan to join us uh, for the book study on Thursday evenings. Uh, and then the last thing is we just have a couple of updates regarding some staff positions we have available. We would encourage you guys to be praying for us as we continue to seek a uh, contemporary worship director. The team that's doing the interviews has been continuing to uh, receive resumes, but they've also started interviewing candidates. We've had some, some strong candidates apply over the last few months, and we're encouraged by that. Uh, but we're continuing to also seek more. And so if you uh, would, just continue to pray for us as we seek the leadership in that service. Uh, and then secondly, we're seeking a facilities director. Many of you know that West Kenyon has been volunteering for us for the last nine months and has been serving faithfully in a bunch of different areas administratively in the church office. Uh, and one of the ways that he was serving is helping to lead our facilities and, and lots of the improvements you see around has been uh, at the hands of, of West and his hard work and we're grateful for the effort that he's put in and now we're prepared to uh, start the search to replace that part of his role uh, with a full-time facilities director and so we've just kicked that uh, search out this week. We encourage you to be praying for that as well. Well, as we think about these things in our body, the needs, the opportunity to join our family, uh, we're reminded that God has brought us together to serve in this city and around the world. Uh, and to do that, we continue to worship together and, and gather together this morning. So with that in mind, let's stand and sing to the Lord. Let's affirm what we believe through the words of the historic Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, 
born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Let's pray together. Lord, we praise you this morning because you are the God of truth. People have lied to us. We don't know what to believe in the media. And then we come to you. The psalmist says, the words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace. You don't shade the truth. You don't leave anything out that we should hear. No lies, no spin, no slippery avoidance. But you are perfectly truthful and your words are perfectly true. What you say is honest and faithful and dependable because you are a God of honesty and integrity. Lord, as we think about this, our own, our own sin becomes all the more clear to us because we are not a truthful people as we should be. Even though we're created in your image, men and women, your representatives on this earth who are supposed to reflect your character and your truth, we fall so far, far short. So we confess our sin to you this morning, especially ways in which we've deceived others, sometimes subtly and sometimes with outright lies. We confess that we have deceived ourselves. We've pushed down the truth, pushed it away so we don't have to think about it because we desperately want to think we are good people. We confess to you deceptive lives that we have been hypocrites, taking your name as your people, but then our lives say something different. Lord, we are so thankful that we can come once again today to the gospel. That you are a God who saves deceitful sinners like us. Jesus saves us from all of our sin through his death and resurrection. The scriptures say, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. And each one of us, in the light of your truthfulness, says, yes, that's true. So Lord, we thank you again for the gospel. We rejoice again in what you have done for us through Jesus Christ, sending us a Savior who carried our sins on the cross and who rose again to give us life and make us a truthful, honest people who live with integrity. And with the confidence in your character and your absolute reliability and faithfulness, we bring to you our requests. Lord, we start with our own church family and we pray for those who are grieving. Particularly, we pray for the family of Ray Hoffman, 
some of whom are here with us this morning, and we pray for your grace and healing and peace to them. We pray for those who are still raw from losing a loved one recently and for those who are marking a hard anniversary. We pray, Lord, for those who are ill or who are recovering. We ask for your healing touch and grace to them. We pray that as a church family, we would speak the truth in love that we would have honesty and openness in our relationships, marked by love, that our words would build one another up, that the Spirit of Christ would live among us as a temple. Lord, we thank you for the generosity of your people, especially through this COVID season. And we pray that as we give, you would continue to bless us so that we can support our families, meet our needs, be part of the growth of the gospel here and around the world. Lord, we pray for Phoenix and the Valley, this region, and we pray for uh, the Uh, ongoing pandemic and COVID not only here but in our nation. We pray that you will keep the numbers down. We pray for first responders. We pray that you will uh, be with those who are recovering. We pray for city officials who are balancing and managing a whole variety of challenges. Everything from zoning to budget to planning for the future to bringing justice. We pray for grace to them. We pray for small businesses that are struggling. And we pray that you'd give hope to those small business owners who are really, really worried right now and that you would provide. Lord, we pray for our own gospel witness here in the valley as we talk to our neighbors and people we work with and family members. We ask that you would give us open doors for the gospel and that we would have the joy of seeing men and women come to know Jesus. Lord, we look around the world and we see so many potential hot spots. Everything from the peaceful uprisings in Belarus to the situation with China. Lord, we ask for grace, grace and more grace and peace in this world. And our hearts say, Lord Jesus, come quickly. You are the Prince of Peace. Most of all, we need you. Finally, Lord, we pray for the one who is seeking truth this morning. For the one who feels you pulling at their heart and wants to know more. We pray that that person, that woman, that man would hear your word today, would believe it, and would find life. You have said, The truth will set you free. I pray that that will be true today. And Lord, we pray this, closing with the words that you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Well, many of us are giving online uh, our tithes and offerings, and because of COVID, we're not passing uh, a plate or a basket down the aisles, but we rece receive an offering as we're uh, walking out. Uh, but we don't want to miss that in the worship service because our giving is an act of worship. And so uh, we have a moment now of offering for you to be able to reflect on the fact that we are giving ourselves completely to God. You can reflect on the words of this hymn, number 32, Great is Thy Faithfulness. God is faithful to us, and so we can trust Him as we give ourselves and our offerings to Him. Our scripture reading this morning is from Matthew, verses 1 through 12. We are in a series on the Sermon on the Mount, and so we are continuing on. Actually, we're just starting it. We did an overview last week, and now we are going to be looking at the Beatitudes together today. So if you have your Bible, or if you are pulling it up on your phone, this is going to be Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. This is God's word to us today. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when Jesus sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad. For your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Lord, we hear these Beatitudes. We read them as uh, dozens, hundreds of generations have done before us. And we feel their power once again today. This is your word to us. Your word is truth because you are a God of truth. 
And so we pray that you'll help us to hear and to engage with your word and to love you more and follow you more closely. Amen. Well, when I was a kid at camp in northern Wisconsin, I learned how to skip rocks with my friends, the other boys in our cabin. And Honey Rock Camp, the lake shore, was scattered with flat, weathered rocks, and the waves on Long Lake were little more than glorified ripples. So it was a perfect place to skim a stone across the surface. With a smooth rock and a good throw, the rock would skip six, seven, eight times. And you know how that is. The first skip is always big. And then the next one is a little bit smaller. And the last couple ones are like that. Some of you could explain the physics of that to me after the service. There's something magical and strangely satisfying about skipping a rock. Well, many people skim across the surface of the Bible like a smooth rock on a lake. They touch briefly, but they don't engage meaningfully with what God says. They stay on the surface and never go deeper into God's word, or rather, God's word never goes deeper into them. And I mention this because it's tempting to skim over the Beatitudes. For one thing, they're incredibly demanding if you really take them to heart. And then they might seem just flat out unrealistic. You can't live this way. It's a lofty, inspiring ideal, but nobody actually does this, do they? So some people read what Jesus says in these verses and they're like a visitor in an art gallery. They appreciate his moral vision. Then they leave and return to the real world. But what Jesus is describing here is normal Christianity. This is what it means to follow Jesus. It's not just a description of Christian leaders like the John Pipers of the world or Kathleen Nielsen, our fall women's kickoff speaker this week. Jesus is describing the heart of everyone who is a child of God. When you enter his kingdom, the radical, counterintuitive blessings of the Beatitudes are yours. Let's notice a few things about the Beatitudes in general. For one thing, as we just mentioned, every Beatitude is for every Christian. Some people think of the Beatitudes like spiritual gifts. Nobody has all the gifts. We each have one or two that are given to us and the body comes together and the the whole is greater than the sum of its parts because we each bring something to the table. And some people think of the Beatitudes this way too. Some mourn while others are peacemakers. Some are pure in heart while others are persecuted. But that's not the way it is. Every beatitude is for every Christian. They're like eight facets of one diamond. They're all for all of us. Another thing to notice about the beatitudes is that the Holy Spirit produces the Beatitudes in our lives through the gospel. Some people think of the Beatitudes like a checklist. And well, I just have to pursue these things. And if I do these things, if I live out the Beatitudes, then God is going to be happy with me. But interestingly, so far in Matthew's gospel, all Jesus has done is preach the gospel. What he's describing here is the blessedness of of those who have responded to what he has preached, the gospel. 
The Beatitudes aren't commands, they're descriptions. Did you notice that? He doesn't say mourn or be meek or be persecuted. He says that those who are this way are blessed. The key to experiencing the Beatitudes is not to check them off a list, but to focus on the gospel. The more and more you take to heart what God has done for you in Christ, the more the Beatitudes will be reflected in your life. As you ponder his mercy to you, to me, how could he be so merciful to me? you'll become more merciful to others. As you think about what he did on the cross and the price that he had to pay for your sin, you will mourn. As you live in his kingdom and think about what he has done for you, you will want to be more pure and pleasing to him. The Beatitudes are the fruit of meditating on the gospel in your life. That becomes even clearer when we notice the first word of each of the Beatitudes, each of the Beatitudes, blessed. Blessed. Blessed doesn't just mean happy. It means that God is for us. He is blessing you. The opposite of blessed isn't unhappy. The opposite of blessed is cursed. By nature, we are cursed because of our sin. We have turned against God and we are his enemies. But when you turn to follow Jesus... Your sins are forgiven through his death and resurrection and God accepts you as his own and blesses you. Jesus spoke these beatitudes and the gospel blessings that they promise come through him. All God's blessings come to us through Christ. There is no blessing without them. He makes the beatitudes the blessings of the Beatitudes to become ours. And one other thing to notice about the Beatitudes is the shape of them. You can think of them like a series of steps, each one building on the other. So we start down in the basement. And the first Beatitude word that we have to start with is in verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The last step, the top of the stairs, is to be treated like Christ in this world. Blessed are you when you're persecuted for righteousness' sake. We can think of the Beatitudes in two sets of four. The first four Beatitudes focus on our deep need before God. The second four describe our lives when we've been satisfied by God's grace. And so as we look at these eight Beatitudes, I'm going to call the first four the blessings of emptiness and the last four the blessings of fullness. The blessings of emptiness and the blessings of fullness. So let's not skim across the surface of God's word this morning like a flat stone. We want to go deeper into these challenging words. We want these challenging words to go deeper into us. So the blessings of emptiness. We start in the basement of spiritual need. And the first step is to be poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now he's not talking about physical poverty. The poor in spirit may fly in corporate jets and they may sleep at a bus stop. To be poor in spirit is to realize that we are spiritually destitute before God no matter how much we have. We have nothing to offer him. Nothing. 
This is the opposite of religion. Religion is a contract. I do things for God, and he does things for me. I do Christian things. I go to church. I read my Bible. I serve. I give. I do all these things. And in return, God gives me the life that I want. Kids and career, health, home, happiness, rewards, retirement. It's a contract. I do my thing for him. He does his thing for me. That's religion. What happens when hard things happen in our lives? Well, there's only two possibilities. If it's a contract, either I didn't do enough or God betrayed me. So when trouble comes, either I'm angry at God or I'm angry at myself. I hate thee or I hate me. And if I'm coming to God with a religious contract mentality, then the way I feel about myself swings between pride and depression. When things are going well in my life, then I'm proud because obviously I've performed and I've kept up my contract. When things aren't going well, then I'm depressed. I'm desperate. I have to do more. That's religion. There's no peace, there's no blessing in religion. It's a treadmill, it's a trap. And it will empty the life out of you. And the first beatitude does away with religion. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Think about that. To enter the kingdom of God, the first thing you must realize is that you have absolutely nothing to offer. You're not his equal. This is not a contract. God doesn't need anything we have to give him. Everything that I have is already his anyway. The psalmist says, speaking, God says in the Psalms, I have no need of a bull from your stall or of goats from your pens. For every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountain and the insects in the field are mine. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you for the world is mine and all that is in it. This is our God. And when we see him for who he is, truly see him, the only option is to come to him poor in spirit. Spiritual poverty, knowing we are unworthy, is absolutely essential for being a Christian. It's the first step from the basement of emptiness. You have to give up on your own goodness. You have to admit that you're powerless to please him. The only thing you can do is hold on to Christ. And this is a growing awareness the longer you follow him. You'll find that the most godly older saints are the ones who have been thinking about their lives honestly and thinking about the gospel and who say even more fervently than they did when they were young, I'm poor in spirit, I have nothing to offer him. It's a growing realization. This Blessed poverty is followed by blessed sorrow. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Well, the obvious question is, mourn for what? The first beatitude is about spiritual poverty. The second one refers to mourning for sin. 
Mourning, of course, for the sin that we see around us and the way we see people's lives hurt, this world hurt, what sin does to relationships. And mourning for our own sin, being grieved by our own disobedience. It's really a bad sign if sin doesn't bother you. Sometimes we think to ourselves, well, you know, I've been, doing, I've been committing this sin and I'm not really stopping. I don't feel bad about it anymore. That must mean that it's not a big deal to God. No. That means that your heart is becoming hardened. We're grieved by our sin. We mourn over it. And again, the older we go in Christ, the more we see of our sin and the more we mourn. I thought I was a pretty good person when I first came to Christ. Then I kept walking with him. And now, I realize I'm far worse than I ever thought I was. We mourn. Christians are not sinless, but we're horrified by what we sometimes do and what we're capable of. The Russian poet Turgenev said, I don't know what the heart of a bad man is like, but I know what the heart of a good man is like, and it is terrible. God comforts us as we mourn with the gospel. Because the gospel tells us that Jesus saves us from the penalty, the power, and the presence of sin. The penalty, the punishment that we deserved for our sin. His, he took that on himself on the cross. He paid our punishment. The power, he broke the power of sin in our lives. We no longer have to sin. Instead, we have his Holy Spirit working inside of us to give us energy to love him and obey him. And one day, he's going to remove even the presence of sin from our lives. We're going to wake up in heaven, and the most amazing thing is that we're not going to have sin inside. We're not going to feel that darkness anymore in our souls. It'll be gone. But until then, we mourn. Blessed are those who mourn. Third beatitude, blessed gentleness. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Well, meek doesn't mean weak or wimpy. Just the opposite. It has the sense of, of strength under control. Gentle strength. As I was thinking about this this week, I thought of a big St. Bernard. One of my friends had a St. Bernard growing up. His name was Brutus. Big old thing. And imagine a St. Bernard with a little poodle running around barking at it. That St. Bernard doesn't even get worked up at all. He knows he's okay. He doesn't have to fight. He doesn't even have to bark back. What is that? That's strength under control. That's meekness. Meekness is the gentle strength, the quiet confidence that comes from trusting God's promises. I'm not in control. I don't have power, but I know my God. And I trust what he says. I don't have to fight because God is on my side. This beatitude is a direct quote from Psalm 37. The psalmist encourages those who are suffering under evildoers to refrain from anger. And he says this, In just a little while the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land or the earth and delight themselves in abundant peace. Now what's interesting about this psalm is that when David wrote it, they were already in the land. They had already inherited the land of Israel. So when he talks about inheriting the land, he's not talking about inheriting property in this world. He's thinking of a better land. This inheritance is heaven. We learned in 1 Peter that we have an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. So that means you can be meek. You don't have to get worked up when the little dogs start yapping around you. 
Your inheritance is secure. You can be gentle. And the fourth beatitude promises blessing for the hungry. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Well, Jesus uses hunger and thirst here to show us how intensely we should crave righteousness. When I saw my surgeon last month, uh, she ended our appointment by saying, uh, and one more thing, Mr. Johnston, she's a very uh, lovely British woman. Uh, Mr. Johnston, you're a bit fluffy around the middle, and I need you to lose weight before surgery. So for the past three or four weeks, I've been trying to get rid of the fluffiness around the middle, and I have been hungry. So this resonates with me. Evidently, laparoscopic surgery is a little bit more difficult. Well, better the leaner you are, I suppose. And when he says thirst, we get that too, because we walk around under the Arizona sun. So what is it that we're hungry and thirsty for? What do we crave? The basic idea of righteousness is to be right with God. We want things to be right between us. That means we need to have anything between us taken care of. Our sin needs to be removed. And the Bible calls this justification. And then we want to live the right sort of lives so that we can maintain a right relationship with God. The Bible calls this sanctification. A famous pastor named Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, It seems to me that righteousness here includes not only justification but sanctification also, being made right with God and, uh, and, and pleasing him with our lives. In other words, the desire for righteousness, the act of hungering and thirsting for it, means ultimately to be free from sin in all its forms and in every manifestation. We want everything to be right with God and we will not be satisfied until it is. The blessings of emptiness. paradoxical, unexpected, counterintuitive blessings that are ours through the gospel. And that leads us to the blessings of fullness, the result of being satisfied by God's goodness to us. His blessing on the merciful. Blessed are those who are merciful, uh, are the merciful, verse 7, for they shall receive mercy. This isn't a quid pro quo, if I'm merciful, then God will be merciful to me. No. Jesus is setting out the same principle that he's going to teach in Matthew chapter 18, the parable of the unforgiving servant. You may remember this story. There was a servant that owed his master an enormous amount of money that he could never repay. I tried to calculate it in today's terms and I came up with $4.8 billion. But his master had mercy on him and forgave him that huge debt. So the same servant then found another man who owed him 600 bucks, uh, I'm sorry, 9,600 bucks and threw him in prison until he paid up. And when the master heard about this, he said, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? I mean, the principle is pretty obvious. If you've experienced God's mercy yourself, if you yourself have been forgiven, then you are going to be merciful to others and you are going to forgive others. Forgiven people forgive people. Unforgiven people really have trouble forgiving. So we have a cycle of blessing here. We experience mercy from God. Our sins are forgiven. We show mercy to others as a result 
because we know just how undeserving we are, and then God gives us more mercy. So the question is, am I merciful? Am I merciful to immigrants and the poor? Am I merciful to those in the grip of drugs and alcohol? To those who look different from me? To those who haven't learned good manners? To those who have hurt you or wronged you? To a parent who let you down? To a son or daughter who betrayed you? To those who disagree with you politically? If you've been forgiven, you can forgive others. If you've received mercy, you can extend mercy. That doesn't mean that things don't change in the relationship and things aren't different now and there aren't consequences. But it does mean that you give mercy even when there are consequences. And if you can't show mercy to somebody, you have to step back and ask yourself, Have I received mercy myself? Have I experienced God's forgiveness? Am I truly saved? The second blessing of fullness is his blessing on the pure. Verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The pure in heart, a pure heart is an undivided heart. It's like an arrow that's shot in one direction. It's spotless and without sin. One time I had a pen that was in my shirt pocket. I don't carry pens in my shirt pocket very much anymore, but at that point I did. And it started to leak, and you know exactly what happened. There was a big blue splotch right in the middle of my shirt. Well, in the same way, sin stains our lives. And we need to be washed clean. We need to be purified. And this is why we need Jesus. The Bible says Jesus himself gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Jesus purifies us. And the promise is that for the pure, they will see God. Now, if you don't love God, seeing him isn't very much of a motivation for you. And you'll think to yourself, well, what kind of reward is that? They'll they'll see God. But if you're a Christian, there is nothing that you want more than to be in God's presence and to see him. The psalmist says, one thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. We want to see God. And that is the reward for the pure in heart. The seventh beatitude calls us to work for peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Again, we make peace because we've experienced peace. God made peace with us, and so as true sons and daughters, we make peace with others. The Bible says, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of Jesus, his son. That's why peacemakers will be called sons of God. God's made peace with them, they make peace with others. When you heal relationships and restore friendships, you are acting like your father in heaven. And the last beatitude is the most painful beatitude and the longest. The beatitude is in verse 10, and and verses 11 and 12 elaborate. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, we should be clear what kind of persecution he's talking about here. He's not talking about people treating you poorly because you're just flat out difficult. I get ornery sometimes, and I can't say that uh, if I'm grouchy, 
that that's persecution for the sake of Christ, even though I kind of want to. It's not. It's not the persecution that you'll have because people are against your politics. This persecution is because of righteousness, a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. No one cares if you say all religions are the same or you only have to be a good person to go to heaven. You say that, you're good to go. You won't be canceled. But if you say Jesus Christ is the only way to God, then you'll get pushback. If you say Jesus is the Son of God who died and rose again for sinners and only he can make you right with God, you can expect trouble. And it's trouble for righteousness sake. Jesus himself was persecuted for saying he is the true son of God. He healed the sick. He forgave sins. He did nothing but good and yet the world was against him because he was righteous. And if you follow him, you'll be treated like him. I was about 10 or 12 years old when I learned to skip rocks on Long Lake in Wisconsin. Let's not skim across the surface of God's word today. The blessings of emptiness confront us with our need. Do you see that you have nothing to offer God? This is what it means to be poor in spirit. Are you grieved by your sin? Do God's promises give you gentle strength? Are you meek? Am I hungry? Am I thirsty for righteousness? The blessings of fullness transform our lives. We're merciful because God is merciful to us. We've been purified and we long to see him. God made peace with us, we make peace with others. We become so much like Jesus, the world treats us the way it treated him. All these are ours through the gospel. The more you ponder and treasure and understand what God has done for you in Jesus Christ, the more these beatitudes will be your experience. We don't want Jesus' words to stay on the surface of our lives. We want God's word to go deep inside us. Lord, we thank you so much that you have given us these counterintuitive, challenging words. And so we pray for your grace to think about all that you have done for us on the cross to think about the power of your resurrection, to think through the implications of what that says about me and the promises that you give to us. And as we think about these things, as we ponder the good news of the gospel, we pray that the Beatitudes will increasingly be ours. We have the communion table in front of us, Lord. What a perfect moment to meditate on what you have done. Amen. The ensemble is going to sing uh, the first few uh, verses of hymn number 527. You can follow along as they're singing. And then we're going to share communion together. You should have been able to pick one up as you came in, a communion cup. If you didn't receive one, uh, I think think there are more in the back. You might want to quick grab one or grab them from people in your row if others haven't. And then after they sing, uh, we'll share communion and then we'll have our closing hymn.
Well, this is the first time we've been able to share communion since March. April, May, June, July, August, September. It's been six months. I've missed it. We always look back to what Jesus said when he gave us this institution. A reminder of what he has done for us. On the night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, we thank you for this bread that reminds us of your body that was broken for us. This brings us back to what you have done for us on the cross. The cross witnesses that we are sinners who deserve death. And the cross witnesses that we have a savior who died in our place. And so we receive this bread with grateful hearts, thankful hearts, joyful hearts, strengthened hearts. Amen. They continued on through the Passover meal And after supper, Jesus took the cup, the last of four cups, I believe it was, and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let's respond with our closing hymn. It should be found in your order of service. It's the last several verses of the Beatitudes song, and uh, we'll stand and sing that together.
May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who called you is faithful, and he will do it. Go with God this week. Thank you.